welcome to this sixth in the series of XP Swim webinars uh, on how to model existing drainage systems and flood mapping with XP Swim. Uh, what we're doing today is taking a look at water quality modeling along with my colleagues uh, Samuel Mahandis and Ludmilla Fadeva. Uh, for those that are, that are new to our webinar series, we have a, a good mixture by the way. Um, a lot of people that are regular viewers, so welcome back to everyone who's been on the previous webinars and really appreciate the feedback. And also a lot of new people coming uh, at each time that we're running uh, the webinar. So to give you an introduction, uh, I'm, I'm Peter Coombs. I'm the Vice President for Business Development for EMEA, so Europe, Middle East and Africa. And my colleagues, Summer Mahandes and Ludmilla Fadeva. Um, Summer uh, has finished his um, degree and then did a postgraduate MSc at the University of Greenwich uh, after spending some time working on supervisory work uh, in Cairo. So his original degree was in Syria uh, and then his master's in the University of Greenwich. Uh, and we have Ludmilla Fadeva who's worked for eight years uh, in the field of drainage and modeling, mainly in the Middle East actually, mainly overseas in the Middle East. And so I will run through a brief introduction uh, and then I'll hand over to Summer and to Ludmilla so that they can run live with the software during the uh, course of this webinar, which is probably going to last about 30, maybe 40 minutes is the target time. So uh, the agenda today is to look at how we can simulate and model pollutants. And after this introduction, we will look at how we can set up a model uh, and add in pollutant concentrations and how we can then monitor the loadings uh, traveling through and routed through drainage systems. We map these concentrations to land usages. So after the introduction, Summer will show you how to do this live. Uh, and then we will look at how those pollutants are routed through a network and how the loadings are building up through the nodes, all flowing down towards the nightfall. So Ludmilla will take a look at the actual uh, routing through and analyzing the results that we are gaining uh, as we go through the day. Thank you. So for those that were not on the previous webinars, uh, we did cover quite a few of the requirements that are coming through from a high level, so a European level, but this is happening globally. I know we have a, a number of people that are tuned in from the Middle East as well. Um, so we, we have uh, two key things that we're concerned about. One is point source pollution, and by that I mean if you have an industrial area and there's a risk of a chemical spillage, or if you have a um, combined sewer overflow, there is a risk of point source pollution coming out of a combined sewer overflow and discharging into a river. Now they're very mindful of that, particularly um, recently the government through DEFRA have actually written a letter to all the water companies uh, within the UK to look at monitoring the vast majority of their CSOs by the year 2020. So this is coming up the agenda increasingly. Why are we worried about this? We're worried about point source pollution for obvious reasons, but also diffuse pollution. And diffuse pollution has been identified within the EU Water Framework Directive, the second bullet point here, EU WFD. The Water Framework Directive came out in the year 2000, and the intention is to bring all the surface water bodies up to a good quality water status by the year 2016 which is next year. And I know that we are not necessarily complying with this across Europe. So we'll look at the diffuse pollution aspects in some detail here today. We have targets, and these targets have, have been publicized quite widely. Um, here's an example from the Urban Pollution uh, Management Manual, the third edition, which is a, a digitized version. Uh, and here you can see what kind of levels we need to satisfy and identify whether our water body, our surface water body, is at a poor, moderate, good, or high status. And as I say, we need to achieve the good status. That's the target. Where does the diffuse pollution come from? Uh, we, can, we can model this in the urban environment. We can model this in the rural environment with XP Swim and XP Storm. Uh, difference between the XP Swim and the XP Storm, by the way, is that the XP Swim also includes a sanitary or a, a foul uh, network modeling uh, capability that Lute Miller will just show to you a little bit later on. But what we can do, we can simulate the surface water in both of these 
and the concentrations of the pollutants and the loadings of the pollutants um, flowing off of a variety of surfaces. And these can be from the rural landscape. It can be from the urbanized landscape. And in the urbanized landscape, this photo comes from our, our colleague, Tony Cooch. Who is, thanks, Tony, for the, the, uh, the slide uh, on a site in uh, the US where hydrocarbon runoff is seen to be uh, a major factor. So when you have long dry spells, we have oils, we have heavy metals building up and deposited rubbers, etc., off of the traffic on the highway. And then we can get a rainfall event after a long dry spell will be the most heavily polluted rainfall runoff. The first flush, we often refer to this. So that contaminated runoff needs to be treated, otherwise it's going to discharge into where? Either into the ground and maybe adversely affect an aquifer, or maybe flow off into a water course like a river. And again, we're going to start building up pollutants within the river, which will then affect the biodiversity, which is the key part of the EU Water Framework Directive, in that we're trying to improve ecosystems, improve biodiversity, not have an adverse effect upon them. So what kind of concentrations of pollutants do you get? And from what kind of surfaces? Well, Summer will go into some detail in this in the, in the live presentation. But the concentrations will vary depending on whether you're in an urban environment and whether you're in a rural environment. The pollutants themselves will vary as well as their, as their concentrations. <clears throat> Within the US, um, there was a major issue with water quality. So the Water Quality Act that came out in the early 1970s um, has built upon sort of 40 years of experience. So the EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, came out with some concentrations in like 1983. Mickelson et al. have also improved on that information in 1993. So there are sources available to identify what kind of concentrations you would apply to a variety of different types of land use. This is what Summer will show you how to set up live with the software in a second. Taking a, a graphical look at this, I want to thank our, our collaborators in Hydro International for providing us with this um, clear, stark photographic evidence of the different types of surface water runoff we can get from a variety of surfaces. Um, so if you look at the left-hand side, uh, what looks like a black oily jar, that is surface water runoff from a motorway services station in the UK. So you can see that where you have a lot of high volume of traffic standing, and I'm thinking of lorries and cars parking there for a few hours or an hour or two, those deposits build up, and then this could be the, um, the first flush coming off of those motorway services areas. Uh, and there are some very good sustainable drainage systems that are now being incorporated into motorway services not just to handle the quantity of the water, but improve the quality of the water before it's discharged off-site. Hopwood Services is one of those uh, examples. It's a good example. So we're looking at the risk of point source pollution or diffuse pollution. We'll concentrate on diffuse pollution during the webinar. And we, we can take into consideration all of the hydrologic cycle, including things like snow melt. This is very topical at this time of year. Well, it is here anyway, on account that we're down to freezing conditions. So we have the, um, the trucks going out overnight on the motorways around the UK, and they're putting down de-icing salt. So some of those pollutants could actually dissolve when temperatures are appropriate and volumes of water are available, or the pollutants may not dissolve. They, they may attach themselves to grits, and then therefore the total suspended solids is the key element. So we'll show you how you can work with a variety of pollutants and set up the concentrations based upon the land use and then analyze the loadings and, and the uh, transfer of those pollutants through a network. There are many ways that we can do this. And what we will do is we'll concentrate on the most commonly used methodology that's this used globally, and that's EMC, Event Mean Concentrations. Uh, what we could do, we could get very elaborate and we could actually build up the information on, on the buildup of the pollutants uh, upon the surface and then when it rains what will be washed off. We can consider the wet spells, we can consider the dry spells, we can even consider the um, street cleaning operations by the sweeping off of uh, grits and, and pollutants from the surface into the mold if we so desire. We're going to concentrate 
on this particular method because it's the most commonly used one globally, the EMC. And there we can add in a mean concentration. So this is the first of those three curves that we're showing you. The other two are, are, are involved with exponential wash-off, where this varies based on the availability of the data that you have to, to hand, and also rating curves. So some of we're going to a little bit more detail about those, but really focus on the EMC methodology. As I mentioned, you can also build into the model the, the, the regularity of the street cleaning, because this can then reduce the amount of pollutant build off. We can literally sweep the pollution off the surface and put in the efficiency of that sweeping and the regularity of that sweeping if we run continual analysis over days, weeks, months, even years, this would have a, a more stark effect. We can even simulate erosion in there as well, which is based upon the transportation of TSS, total suspended solids, through the system. So this, this particular chart is showing you the buildup of the pollutants upon a surface. Um, there's a rainfall event at the top of the graph there. So that rainfall event arrives and then washes off a certain amount of the pollutants which are then taken down through presumably a surface water drainage network. Lude Miller will share those kind of results with you with the live demonstration. Now when we, when we have the street sweeper coming in, that can reduce the amount of material on the surface by whatever percentage we know that that is gaining. There are a lot of good studies that have been carried out. Trinity College Dublin is a good example that we can share with you if you need this kind of information. So we will concentrate on the EMC methodology but if there are other situations that you are dealing with on your projects, just contact us directly and we're going to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis after the event. And the all-important end product is what are the results? So we could build up a model with up to, say, 20 different pollutants. Uh, we're going to concentrate on two of them, uh, BOD, Biological Oxygen Demand, and TSS, total suspended solids, but it's, it's not a limitation. We just want to demonstrate to you uh, and clarify through the results on the uh, loadings and the, uh, the, the cumulative load of those pollutants, uh, as well as the concentrations of those pollutants being routed through drainage systems. So when we find that we have problems, how do we fix them? Uh, this is where the whole concept of sustainable drainage systems, low impact development, best management practices, whatever you want to call these um, elements, uh, come into play. So this is where we're retrospectively having to try to find the space to fit in things like bioretention areas and filter strips. Uh, and this is increasingly happening in the developed world where we know we have situations of uh, flood risk and we're trying to take stormwater out of the system. If we build in bioretention areas alongside a highway, like the, the Tony Cooch photograph, uh, then we can better improve not just the quantity, but the quality of the water being discharged as well, which will help us to comply with the directives that are coming through from governmental levels. So I think that's a long enough of an introduction. Apologies for that, but uh, I'd now like to hand you over to my colleague, first of all, to Salman Mahandis, who will show you how to actually set up these models in the first instance. Salman. Thank you, Pete. Good afternoon, everyone. Lovely to see you over here today. Today, I'm coming to go through modeling water quality in XP Swim. As pollutants are land use dependent, which means uh, pollutants from a farm runoff are different from pollutants from a paved area runoff. As the stormwater will pick up different materials from different surfaces, so we're going to look at the land uses today. So, what we can do with XP Swim, one of the things we can generate pollutants and then we can route these pollutants in a network. We can run a single event, or we can run a continuous simulation, and then we can use the model to predict flow and pollutographs. Uh, when I say pollutographs, I mean pollutant concentration over time. So why we're interested in water quality and what is the outcome of it? Well, the outcome of water quality modeling will allow us to estimate the maintenance schedule, evaluate the impact of new development on existing systems, and developing total daily maximum loads. I think you, most of you are familiar with software. This is the end of the series. So we are in the runoff mode. And here, when we can simulate two major processes, build up of pollutants and wash off these pollutants over time. So let's start with the modeling, uh, the first step in our modeling, which is the land use. 
if I go to configuration and global data, I have the option to set a runoff land use. And for the sake of example, we're going to choose residential and greenfield. Then we can set up pollutants. And in XP Swim, we model conservative pollutants as we don't model the interaction between them, which means uh, that we won't get salt coming out of XP Swim when we have sodium and chloride together. So let's assume that we have TSS and BOD. Here, when you have the option to choose uh, your unit, and for example, it, our unit here is milligram per liter, and you have the option to tick a daily decay rate. So this is only when you have pollutants decaying over time because of the bacteria and viruses absorbed in, in plants. So we can add a percentage of a particular pollutant, let's TSS, we can add a percentage to another one, to another pollutant. We're not going to do that. And then you can uh, put your concentration in precipitation, concentration in groundwater, and in residential areas, we can put the efficiency of our street sweeping. And if we have catch uh, basin, we can like initially load this ca catch basin with the concentration. So now, uh, after that, we want to connect each pollutant to the land uses. Because uh, as I told you, these pollutants are land use dependent. So if I go to the build up and uh, build up slash wash off, I can connect TSS to Greenfield and TSS to residential, same for BOD. And from here, I have the option either to select build up or not. And we're going to say none because we're looking uh, at a single event. But if you're looking at continuous simulation, this is when build up becomes necessary. So we're going to say none for now. And as Pete mentioned earlier, we have the option either to use the most common way, which is given mean concentration, or we can uh, use more sophisticated way. In the event mean concentration, all that we have to do is to put the concent mean concentration for TSS in Greenfield, and we assumed it's 60 milligram per liter. For residential, we assumed it's 100. And for BOD in the green field, we assume it's 7 milligram per liter. And for residential areas, it's going to be a little bit more 10. OK. What about if I want to use the rating curve? And if you, if you really get fussy and you want to use it, or if you have a fussy boss, you can click on the rating curve. And from this exponent, you can represent how, like the mode flow you have, you will have more transportation for, uh, for the pollutants, which means more, more concentration. So we put something more than one in the exponent here. But if we put the exponent between zero and one, we are looking at solving these pollutants when we have mode flow. When this exponent is zero, the rating curve will become given mean concentration again. Because R power zero will be one. After that, we will go to the runoff job control from the conf configuration. And then we will tick the water quality. And here we put the pollutant that we want them to be included in our analysis. So we might have like several pollutants here and we want just to look at the TSS and BOD. Same for the land use. We want to include just the green field and residential. And we have the option to take the erosion. <coughs> the erosion is usually added to TSS. Uh, we have the option to take on uh, catch basins, street sweeping, and we, have, we can say how many days do we have before uh, dry days we have before the simulation. The last step will be going to each node and picking the water quality, saying what is the percentage of greenfield in, in this area, what is the percentage of residential uh, in, in this particular catchment, 
So we can do this from XP table. We can pick the water quality and choose the percentages. And then when we run the model, uh, we can get the results and we can get the loads for the TSS and BOD and we can get the concentrations. And after getting the loads and concentrations, and by the way, we can get cumulative load, kilogram or kilogram per second for each time step. And after we get all the concentrations and loads, we can route these pollutants in a network. But this is the end of my part for today. I will hand you over to Ludmila, who will show you how to route these pollutants in, in a network. Over to you, Ludmila. Thank you, Sam. So now, once we have all the pollutants uh, loaded with different land uses to our nodes, I have a model here where all the nodes are actually interconnected with the pipes. I'm now just going to check node number one to see what we have inside. So what we can see, node number one has uh, some concentration of 72 milligram per liter of TSS and um, the cumulative load is about 129 kilograms. As Summer told, we can go to properties and untick the cumulative and then we will see grams per second. So then it will be a slightly different graph, but I'm interested in cumulative. Uh, similarly, we can check our numbers for, for BOD, but at the moment I'm going to speak only about TSS. So what I will do, uh, I will check the pipe as well. So if we click on a pipe and go review results, we can actually see that in the pipe we have exactly the same picture. So our concentration is about 70 milligram, 72 milligram per liter and our cumulative load is about 129 kilograms. Which makes a complete sense because this pipe is connected only to one node and one catchment. So uh, obviously the numbers should be the same in a node and in a pipe. So now, if I'm going to select all the nodes on, on the main branch, which go all the way to the outfall, and tick review results. So let's see what we have in here. We have different concentrations for different nodes, because each node has catchment attached with different numbers inside. So for node number one, we have 72 a milligram per, per liter. Node number two goes up to 92 milligram per liter. Node number three is about 87. Node number four, again, maybe 87. And node, node number five, which is out for, is again 87, 88. So we can see how it changes because all different uh, catchments contribute and the, the, the software calculates what will be the concentration at the node, say, in, in a node number two the concentration will be calculated based on three different catchments and three different initial numbers. When we go back to review results and we actually look at the loads, what we can see in here is in node number one we have 130 kilograms. Node number two it's 550, so it's growing, which makes sense. Node number three it's 1300, it's growing again. Node number four it's 1600, it's growing. And then at the outfall, Somehow we have 700 only. So this, this rings a bell. Something is wrong. So if we go to hydraulics mode and tick on a dynamic section view and play the model, what we actually see is that we have node number 2, 3 and 4 flooding. So this means that we have partially our load is not is, is lost out of the system. So we lose the contamination which was actually collected from the catchment and it entered the pipeline but then at some point of a time it was lost out of the system because of the flooding. So now it makes complete sense why the cumulative load drops down from 1600 to 700. Right? So if we go back again and just see, so we have 1600 in here and 700 in an outfall. So we lose all this load due to flooding. So now there are different ways how we can see the amount of flooding and calculate amount of load lost. 
we can go in hydraulics mode review results and it is set in the properties for overflow we can see that overflow is ticked that's why we see only one graph so uh, we can see that node number one and outflow has zero overflow but other three nodes has some overflow numbers associated the other way we can do it we can uh, see the overflow through the tables so it's flood loss Right, again, node number two, node number three, and node number four has a flood loss. So based on a volume of water which is lost, and based on a concentration which is at that particular node, we can calculate what was the cumulative load, or what, what was the load which was lost at that particular node. This is if we are talking about diffuse pollution. And if uh, we are talking about point source pollution, uh, like a sanitary model, uh, which is domestic sewerage model, we then go to a sanitary mode. Uh, sanitary mode was uh, widely covered in, in, uh, in our webinar number five, which was a uh, sanitary webinar. So if you want to see, you can go back to the recordings and check what we did talk about. So if I just double click on a node in a sanitary mode, we, I see completely different picture. And in here, I have an option which says sewer inputs. If I tick in here, what we can see there is pollutants. So a list of pollutants, they can go up to 20. And at the moment, because some are set up only two, which is TSS and BOD, we can have only two. So we can uh, enter some concentrations in here. As well, if we have any temporal variation for this pollutant, we can set up a temporal variation similarly as we do for dry weather flow, and we can have a different variation. So basically, if this is a domestic flow, so we can set up a domestic temporal variation, which will be same as our domestic catchment inflow. Uh, obviously, we can have many different pollutants, and uh, we can have some uh, constant flow if you like and uh, we can some initial load we can add as well so uh, there are different options of how it can be done and what you can enter in there but obviously once you have both once you utilize sanitary and runoff mode together you will be looking into diffuse pollution and point source pollution at the same time within the same simulation the only thing you need to take care of when you go to mod properties here you need to tick sanitary as well so it calculates everything which happens in the sanitary mode so that's it for me for today i'm handing you over back to peter for some conclusions perfect thank you Ludmilla, and thank you summer we could have spent maybe a day <laughs> going through all the various options here on what we could have shown you um, but as, as I said at the beginning, the EMC is definitely the most commonly used. It's, it's uh, the most straightforward process and it gives you some really good results. So uh, hopefully that's helped everyone to see um, how we can then model the water quality aspects, whether that be point source or really we're concentrating more so on the, on the diffuse pollution nowadays. So have no doubt that this, these methodologies within XP Swim have been around for quite some time. And there's a lot of fantastic experience globally with, with colleagues like Tony Cooch as well, who have been inputting for the last 20 odd years uh, into the XP Swim, XP Storm technologies to enable us to comply or at least identify the loadings and the concentrations to then give us the options. We can then look at scenarios. Uh, for those that have not already been involved with the webinars, this is the sixth and the final one in our series on modeling. But we built up a, a sequence of modeling webinars, including things like running a variety of different scenarios. So what we could do is take these pollutants and then look at the flooding uh, but as a base scenario. And then we can generate another model uh, and utilize that with maybe incorporation of bioretention areas to alleviate both the flooding and also make sure that we're treating the pollutants as well. So have a look on the website, the xpsolutions.com website. Um, under the resources drop down, there are a series of videos. There are so many of them nowadays, we've actually built in a filter for you. Um, so there are different subject matters or maybe different products 
any uh, information that you need more, then just contact us directly as well, and we'll be more than happy to share our, our experiences and uh, knowledge and, and help you to satisfy your particular needs. So, in conclusion, I hope you can appreciate how relatively straightforward this is to produce information and models uh, to satisfy the increasingly important aspects of water quality. So whether your clients are water companies or the environment agency or local authorities, you, you can meet those requirements. We can look at the transportation of pollutants, we can map the pollutants to the different land usages, and we can look at the concentrations and the loadings uh, at source or throughout the network. And it's a bit of a sad, sad occasion on account that this is the end of the modeling series. That's the bad news. The really good news is that the next event that we're running is on the 11th of February. Um, so there is a continuation. We do really appreciate the feedback and the requests of the different topics that are coming in. On the 11th of February, we'll be looking at making space for the water. So switching into a more um, looking at a, a project at the outset, uh, at, the, at the beginning of the concept and the planning of a new development to see if we can make space for those bioretention areas and swales and things. Maybe if we look at where the local hydrology is working right now and we can identify the blue-green corridors, can we incorporate that into the public open space and maximize the land value? and also provide the multiple benefits that we can gain to avoid these problems in the future, a more sustainable way of, of designing. So have a look again on the website. We will send out a survey monkey. We've recorded this webinar, so we will edit, upload onto the website and send out a link so that you can rerun the webinar at your convenience. And we will be sending out a survey monkey just for the feedback and for you to request your CPD certificates. Uh, we've had hundreds of questions, uh, so we are going to produce a frequently asked question sheet covering all the different webinars. We have uh, those for the XP Swim series on the modeling, and we have the questions on the sustainable drainage design with the micro drainage. So we will be incorporating those into FAQs that we'll send out to all the attendees. And meanwhile, if you'd like to go to the website, take a look at the videos, and then register for the, for the next event. We look forward to seeing you then. And I'd like to just thank Summer and Ludmilla for your participation and for the audience at large. Have a great day. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.